the doors are being closed as we speak. Could you please take your seats? And um, help me welcome uh, Samir and, and Gregory or so, uh, who will tell us how to ransom our, our ways out of this room again. Over to you. Stop. Yeah. OK. So hi, my name is Samir, and this is my colleague. Uh, Gregory Panikal. And we're both representing K7 Threat Control Lab. And we're going to talk about ransomware today. Um, ransomware is a particularly nasty type of uh, malware, uh, very destructive. And uh, we need to do something to fight back against it. And uh, we think we can do that. We're going to show you how to do that. So uh, all of us can put that nasty stuff in that sarcophagus and close the lid. OK? Start off with, um, there are a couple of types of ransomware. There's, there's one type over here behind me, which is uh, a kind of screen locker type, which is not the kind of malware we're going to be talking about or ransomware we're going to be talking about. Instead, we're going to talk about something like this, which is uh, the file encryption kind. Um, it's the kind of ransomware which find, you know, locates target files and encrypts them with a large uh, key. And the only way in which you can get your files back is by paying the ransom and uh, getting a private key to decrypt the files, and then you've got them back, if you're lucky. So before we go any further, um, just want to talk about the motivation behind um, why we were talking about ransomware. I did say that ransomware is nasty. Um, so a few months ago, there was a particularly um, aggressive campaign of CTB Locker, which was doing the rounds. And um, I was trying to provide quick generic detection against this stuff. Um, and accidentally, on my research machine, which is isolated, um, my desktop looked a bit like this. So it meant that <laughs> I had accidentally run um, the uh, ransomware on, from the command prompt, so it didn't actually care what the extension of the files were. Um, but that effectively meant that a lot of my stuff was encrypted. So I have to uh, do something about that. So I started discussing with my colleague, Greg, and we came up with a plan. Now, ransomware is something that is very, you know, as I say, it's very prevalent. It actually gets through and infects lots of stuff. Uh, but it is actually like lots of other malware. And a lot of malware these days, um, you know, they tend to be obfuscated. And this is one of the reasons why they're very successful at getting past scanners, right? So here are a few examples. Here's an example. Uh, the first sort of, you know, wrapper we've, we've seen is you know, MSIL. So it's uh, a, a .NET wrapper. And, and behind that, there was CTB Locker. Uh, after that, we saw, at the same time, uh, a Visual Basic wrapper. And behind that was also CTP Locker. Um, and at, again, within the same sort of campaign time frame, there was a Nullsoft uh, self-extracting archive. Behind that was Clark Gable. Uh, and behind Clark Gable, there was CTP Locker. So I'll just explain that. Uh, what happened was that um, the, the NSYS archive had a DLL which would load a file called Clark Gable or MP3, which was encrypted, encoded um, um, data, which was then loaded, and it ran CTP Locker. So CTP Locker was a good example of something that uses a variety of different packers to make sure it gets past scanners. And there are other ransomware that also do that, like CryptoWall. So it's particularly easy to uh, get past static scanning. What about dynamic blocking? Well, the thing is that um, ransomware tends to uh, sort of you know, decrypt itself or um, inject itself into new processes. It, it injects itself into a new process and then decrypts itself into that. And it can either be a non-OS process, so it could be a charge process of itself, uh, in which case sometimes uh, what happens is you lose some process context if you're trying to d block dynamically. Uh, but a lot of them also inject into operating system processes, so like, you know, ex uh, Explorer or SVC host or something like that. And maybe that's done because those are less likely to be monitored. However, it does give you an opportunity because if there is an untrusted process which is injecting into Explorer or SVC host or, you know, LSAS or whatever you, you like to call it, um, it should be raising some eyebrows. Uh, it is suspicious. If you have rights to target files which are coming from 
uh, an operating system process, or if you have um, some magic numbers related to encryption or related to hash functions within the memory space of an operating system process, then that should be something that raises some flags. So you should be able to block that. So it does give us opportunities. Now, before we talk about our proof of concept demo, um, we should talk about what happens typically during uh, an encryption um, you know, procedure. So this is a typical life cycle. First of all, there's a target file, which is perfectly decent. It could be a, an image file or a doc file. And we have a CNC server, which is controlled by the bad guys. Then there is a uh, key pair created. So you have a, a master key and a, uh, so you have a master public key and a master private key. And we're not going to use them quite yet. We'll use them, using them shortly. So let's say that the, this local machine is now infected. What is usually gen generated locally is a session key. This is a symmetric key, um, which is something like AES or RC4 or something, which uses an initialization vector, which is local to the machine. And that is then used to um, encrypt a target file to create what we call a pupate blob. Now, why do we call it a pupate blob? It's because this target file, which used to have a recognizable format, uh, so it's a known file type usually, is created, is then converted into an amorphous blob. So we call it a pupate blob. Okay, that is central to uh, our strategy. So keep that in mind. Then what happens is the session key is operated on by the uh, public key from the bad guys, and the entire thing is then shipped to the CNC server. And then we would expect the session key that encrypted all the target files to be destroyed on the local machine. So using this kind of method, the only way in which you can get your files back is by the private key, after paying the ransom, of course, the private key operating on um, this encrypted session key, and the session key is then used to get all the files back. Now, something to bear in mind is that this um, public key that we're talking about over here can either be embedded in the malware itself, or it could be obtained via the network. Now, if it's obtained via the network, uh, and as in the case of something like uh, CryptoLocker in 2013 or, or CryptoWall, it does give you an opportunity to block at the network level itself, which means that the encryption won't go any further. Um, a couple of assumptions. Well, we have four assumptions, which are reasonable. Uh, they're reasonable because it, it just so happens that all of these are true with the ransomware we've seen so far. First of all, Ransomware does get past first lines of defense. So it means your gateway you know, can come via email. It gets past your static scanners. It gets past dynamic scanners. And uh, UAC is not going to help you either. So we assume all of these things are true. Others, our proof of concept doesn't, doesn't mean anything. We'll already, already block the stuff. We also assume that ransomware comes from an untrusted source. Uh, we will explain this later after we have shown you the demo. And finally, we assume that the ransomware will run in ring three. So it's a user mode process. OK, so with that, I hand over to my colleague, Greg. So uh, much like the real world scenario, uh, the ransomware follows a few uh, critical stages as part of its infection process. First is, of course, uh, locating the target files. So in this case, it basically enumerates through the directories uh, that's on the user system. Uh, looks for files that could be of value to the user based on the extension. And then, once that is, those are identified, uh, the data is basically taken hostage. That means that it basically is getting encrypted and the original data is destroyed. Once that is done, then the user is you know, presented with an option to you know, basically, they are asking for ransom so that he can uh, decrypt and retrieve his data. Now, one of the things what we did or oh, what we wanted to do as part of a proof of concept was basically establish the intent of ransomware so that uh, we could, to a you know, certain degree of uh, confidence, that we could say that it is indeed a ransomware uh, process that's happening. So in order to do that, uh, we had to have some sort of interception points placed into the uh, operating system for you know, watching various activities, file system activities, etc. So the options that were available to us is basically, you know, place hook using user mode, uh, user mode hooks, and you know, basically intercept the basic standard APIs and things like that. 
But there's a disadvantage in that uh, process because uh, it doesn't give you a privileged access and also uh, there is an issue with uh, getting a bird's eye view of all the activities that's there. So what we did finally was we ended up using a kernel mode driver which basically you know, runs with a higher privilege. And in addition to that, it also helps us get, gain a bird's eye view of the whole you know, file system activities that's happening on the system. Then we had to identify the interception points where we had to place uh, you know, our hooks or you know, basically the interception point. So these are the ones that we identified. These are all major functions defined in the kernel. Uh, one is, uh, of course, the create operation. Uh, this includes both file creation and uh, directory creation, and they're open as well. Then we intercepted the directory control operation. This was for basically intercepting the directory enumeration that the ransomware does. In addition to that, we added uh, interception point at write so that we could have a, you know, a, we could identify an encryption process. Lastly, we place the interception point in close and cleanup. This was necessary so that uh, we, we, we have an opportunity to uh, revert some of the, uh, let's say, damage that uh, the ransomware does. Uh, and we, we, we do know that, okay, th uh, this operation is being ended now. Now we, we, it's an opportunity for us to take action. The framework which we use to implement the proof of concept, we, uh, we basically use the file system mini filter. It's an architecture that is available from Windows 2000 SP4 and above. And uh, it basically gives you callbacks. And uh, you, know, you are able to inspect the data and take actions on it. So once we had the interception points decided, uh, the next step, what we wanted to do was basically have some sort of a trigger point so that we could have deeper tracking of uh, the activities involved. So what we ended up using is basically directory enumeration. Now, this is an operation that is common to a very few process, but it's not very common across processes. In the sense that, for example, Explorer and Search Indexer that runs on your Windows system, uh, does this all the time, but not all the processes. So this was being used as a trigger point. And this was a critical first stage that the ransomware does in order to locate the target files. The next step was tagging the various activities once you find this trigger point. There were a few options in front of us. The first one was tagging at uh, uh, process level. Uh, it would work for few ransomware families, but there are ransomware families that inject code into uh, the operating system processes, which means that you had uh, some process that does some good activities and bad activities. And so you cannot with good confidence say that it is indeed a ransomware uh, action that is taking place. So we rule that out. The next option that was presented to us was uh, tagging or maintaining the context at thread level. Uh, it does work for some ransomware process, our ransomware families. Uh, but a few of them, such as CTB Locker, split their work among multiple threads. You had one thread that enumerated the directories, built up the list that needed to be encrypted, uh, and further, another thread was spawned to dust the encryption process. So this was also ruled out. So what we noticed during our study of this ransomware family is, uh, even though uh, either in a single thread or ransomware, ransomware family, or in case of multi-threaded one, uh, the code basically, or the threads originated from the same code block. So if you are able to maintain a context uh, tag along with the code block, we are able to say that, okay, this code block first enumerated the directory, followed by uh, you know, encryption process and so on. So we are able to say with good confidence that, yes, it is, it is acting like a ransomware. So we went ahead with that. The next step was basically we had to uh, identify the actual encryption process. So we, we obviously use the uh, IRPMJ uh, right monitoring. And in order to actually identify the encryption process, uh, we used a couple of techniques. One was basically we saw, a th or we tried to identify change from a, a known file type into an unknown file type. So you have documents and uh, you know, various file formats with uh, you know, fully documented ma magic values. And if you see a, such a file being changed or modified into a pupate blo blob, uh, that's a clear indication that, okay, it's something is trying to destroy its data. So you, we use that. Now for files which we, d we are not aware of, or things such as text files where uh, it doesn't have a clearly marked magic values, uh, we, used, uh, and we used an increase in entropy as an indication to uh, know that, uh, yes, some sort of encryption process is happening there. So with that, we are able to say, yes, uh, the ransomware is it is a ransomware-like activity, and we could proceed further. Now, we wanted to minimize the damage. 
so there were a few things that the ransomware does, uh, which we needed to revert. First, of course, is the, uh, the encryption of the data. So we are not able to say probably from in the first write itself that, OK, it is indeed an uh, encryption process. So we had to buffer a few of the writes uh, prior to being flagged as uh, the ransomware, as a ransomware encryption process. So what we did in our POC was we basically let the write go through, but backed up the original data in memory along with the you know, attack data as part of the code block. And once we identified that it was a ransomware activity, we basically restored the data. The other form of, uh, let's say, a damage that the ransomware does is move around the files while it was encrypting the, uh, you know, the data on disk. So uh, you could see some of the ransomware move, take the files from the original location, move to a temporary directory with a random name, uh, and encrypt the data, and then move back with a new you know, extension attached to it. So in order to minimize that damage, we basically maintain a small journal uh, as part of the code block context. Uh, and once we identified that, it was a ransomware that was, uh, you know, it was being identified as a ransomware. We went back through the journal and reverted all its actions. So that's what we did to minimize our damage. Now, let's see the demo. We have a live demo in with us. So what I have here is a Tesla Crypt sample. And uh, yeah, it's from earlier this year. And this is one of the files which we identified that is uh, encrypted initially as soon as the ransomware is executed. It's a text file. So as you can see, it's just recognizable content with you know, English text. Now I'm just going to launch our uh, POC driver and the user mode application. Takes a few seconds to launch. In the background, I have some debug strings being printed out uh, once the driver starts so that we could see the various activities, such as it was tracking the uh, directory operation enumeration and uh, you know, code block based tagging and et cetera. Et cetera. So, OK, it's up. Now I'm going to basically execute the sample. Yeah, it has identified the uh, ransomware exe that tried to do the encryption process. I'm just going to pause. So in this case, the, it was flagged because there was an uh, increase in entropy detected. Uh, from as because the text file was being attempted to be encrypted. Now, if you see the original text file, that that it is unmodified. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to revert this uh, snapshot and run the same Tesla Crypt sample without the driver running, without a POC running so that you could see what sort of damage it actually does without uh, the infrastructure in place. Takes a few seconds. Take it longer than usual. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to run this sample. Okay. Now I'll go back to the directory. So as you can see, the file name got changed and extra extension got uh, added. And if you see its content, it's completely unrecognizable. It has changed. It basically got encrypted. So I'm going to let the sample run in the background, and uh, we could see the splash screen at the end of the presentation. Back to Samir. OK, so we've seen the demo. Um, there are obviously a, a couple of risks that um, exist in doing this kind of detection. It's no different from any other type of detection that we were used to doing uh, you know, over the years. So obviously, one is false positives, right? Um, there could be some legitimate program that wants to encrypt files, uh, which could then, obviously, it'll change uh, the magic markers, it'll increase entropy, and so on. Uh, so we need to consider that. And there could be a slowdown in the system as well, because we're now monitoring certain types of processes. So obviously, we've got, you know, there are some hooks in place, and it's going to run a bit slower. So how do we mitigate against these? 
Well, fortunately for us, you know, um, one thing that we can do is, you know, is going to actually help with both of these, and that is to tighten the process context. We are not going to monitor absolutely everything. We'll just um, monitor, you know, hook into um, executables that we think are coming from an untrusted source. So that could be from the internet, or it could be from a, a removal device, uh, something which where we are allowed to tag it as suspicious, so we can look deeper into it. Uh, we could do things like, well, you know, um, the program, uh, the process didn't come from um, program files directory because if it happens to be a legitimate program that is encrypting stuff, it is most likely to have been installed as um, a proper pro sort of a proper program in program files. Apart from that, there are various things we can do, which is, you know, is the file dish designed? Do we maintain a whitelist? I mean, these are things that we do normally with other types of detection. So we don't really expect too much of an issue in this respect. What about Android? Um, so there is ransomware for Android, and this was mentioned um, by uh, you know, a couple of my colleagues yesterday, and they talked about Simple Locker, so, so, so I'll, I'll do that as well. Well, the thing is that the same framework that we've described for Windows malware can, you know, win Windows ransomware can also be used for Android uh, in theory. The issue is that in practice, uh, in Android, the um, malware process and the AV process, you know, security product, they both run as user mode processes at the same level. So it's not really possible to, um, to provide low-level hooks to actually give us a bird's eye view of what's going on. So this is going to be very problematic. And in addition to that, uh, malware in Android can also register for this callback, the boot completed one, which can ensure that it runs before your security uh, app runs. So, you know, this, this actually does complicate the process of monitoring and blocking. We talked about this at last year's VB. I mean, we didn't actually talk, but we had a, a, um, a presentation on it, which is online if you care to look at that. So just to wrap up, um, ransomware is actually a very destructive type of malware, and um, we must do something about it. We can fight back. Um, we believe that we've shown you, um, you know, a very simple strategy, but it works, and we actually have covered all of these very famous uh, ransomware samples, I mean, as the ones that we have seen so far. Uh, we, we do believe that, obviously, you know, if, if they change their strategies, that we would have to, you know, keep up with that, but I think we can uh, put them to bed. And with that... Are there any questions? So, um, are there any questions to this interesting presentation? Don't be shy. There's a question up front here. Uh, would it be uh, easy for ransomware writers to change the encryption mechanism so they don't touch the uh, first, say, 500 bytes of the document? keeping the file type the same. And if, if the entire industry, say, were to adopt this uh, approach to detection. And the second question is, have you tried it not on text files, but say JPEG, which will probably have high entropy, and whether you have the thresholds for the kind of entropy changes that will work out for JPEGs, not just for text files? Sure. So the, one, the first question you talked about was supposing they don't overwrite the first uh, they, they don't overwrite the markers, right? They encrypt somewhere else. So we have, as I said, you know, uh, if we do something like this, then that's the way they're going to go. So we would have to monitor another part of the file. Um, and we believe that if we are able to monitor it, we can still see sort of chunks of, of data changing the format. The second part which you talked about is a JPEG file. Now, JPEG already has high entropy. I suppose that is what you're, you're, you're driving at. Uh, but the thing is that if they still change the uh, JFIF at the beginning, we can still flag it. So you'll have to do it in conjunction. So as I said, you know, we would need to keep monitoring how they do things, and we'd have to change the strategy, and we'd have to keep you know, morphing things uh, on, on our side as well. These are both valid questions, and we have thought about them. Um, but for the current you know, the time being, we believe we've covered everything. 
Um, but they make lots of money out of this, right? So obviously, you know, supposing we all implement this, which is what we want, uh, so we can make um, the world a safer place for lots of people who lose their sort of, you know, personal files and so on, um, we will have to keep changing things and staying on top of it. I don't know if that helps you, but, yeah. So another Hi. question yeah. from the middle. Hi, can you talk a little bit more about the false positive cases that you have encountered? Yes, I can. We've encountered exactly zero false positive cases because it has not, <laughs> it has not been deployed uh, in reality. But see, <laughs> it's a proof of concept. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, yes, it is a possibility. Let's, let's say it's a probability, actually, but we don't expect too many because um, if we lock down the process context, as I said earlier, you know, we actually focus only on uh, very targeted processes that seem to come from an untrusted source, then it is less likely to flag something that it's not supposed to. And as we all know, we all flag things that we're not supposed to in, in other contexts, not just in this type of detection strategy, in other types of detection strategy. So under those situations, we can always build in um, you know, a whitelisting approach that we can be used, which is, which is probably going to happen on very few files. Uh, we don't expect the kind of things that we're talking about here to happen very regularly on lots of files where the false pause risk is going to be very high. I don't know if that helps you, hopefully. So another from the middle. Uh, Hi. Do you have any provisions uh, for known file packers performance, say, if you detect that, say, it's a PK? Do, do you have any uh, provisions for known file, file formance uh, packers? Say that if it's a zip archive, it tries to pack a file, then you detect the PK in the front, and then you skip it. And the second question, have you ever tried to actually intercept the symmetric key and store it somewhere when, when, something, when the packing happens, when the obfuscation happens? Have you tried to get the key? This is the key, yes. Um, no, because, so I'm going to answer the second question first because I actually heard it, and then you can repeat the first question, which I didn't hear. Uh, the second question was, are we able to get the key that was used for the encryption yeah. from memory? Um, see, the thing is, I would, you know, one of my colleagues talked about that yesterday um, in one of his talks, but uh, I, I think there's a major issue with that because you need to recognize that you're actually being, I mean, I, I suppose we could do it in, since we're monitoring stuff, but you need to know where the key is, which means that using different um, ransomware, you'd actually have to uh, maybe look through quite a lot of memory space, you know, searching for something that looks like a key, which is not necessarily going to be very um, uh, a high percentage solution. I mean, we haven't looked into it. We could if we needed to. Uh, in the case of TessaCrypt, you know, it, it maintains the key in a part of memory as, you know, was demonstrated yesterday. But that is not always the case. And we don't really, we cannot predict exactly, you know, uh, what's going on in that. So we can't do it, right? I mean, we would then need to, for every type of ransomware we're looking at, we'd have to have a different uh, algorithm to see where that key is, uh, which is quite a lot of overhead. I don't know what your first question was. Something well, about the first packets. question was on the heels of the false positive. Say if the uh, zip, if you have a file that is getting packed by the zip, by the, by the uh, arch or zip archive or the zip program, how do you discern that from the, um, the ransomware? File you mean that zip would also change the file format? Well, the zip would change the entropy. But it would sure. not f change it in place. Oh, okay. Yeah. We thought about that one too. So, so I think there was, yeah, exactly, somewhere up front there. Hello. Hello. Uh, you mentioned that you were limiting uh, the detection for like untrusted processes. But on one of the first slides, you also mentioned like uh, injection to processor so that you cannot rely on the process. So how it works together? Basically, we detect on the code block. So even if you are injected into the target process, uh, OS process, we only you know, target on the code block. So it's a newly allocated piece of memory. So uh, it's disconnected from you know, the OS DLL area, memory area and things like that. So we can identify that separately from the trusted content whatever part is a part is part of the, part of the OS. Yeah. So, 
we still have, still have time for one or two more questions. Are the, is there anybody else who has a question at this point? Yes, all the way in the back, as inconvenient as possible. <laughs> Sir, you're making it our life difficult. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So I guess if the malware will uh, create a copy of the file and then delete the original one, your proof of concept will not catch it. Is it so or I'm wrong? Well, there are various different ways in which you know, the proof of concept can be broken. Uh, as I said, we'd have to keep evolving. Um, it, it depends on, you know, we can probably monitor even to that extent. But yeah, sure. Um, Basically, we should evolve to the strategies that's being uh, employed uh, at the moment. I mean, uh, it's actually, since it's a proof of concept, uh, I mean, there are ways in which you can bypass, but whatever is out there now, uh, we are covering all of them. Correct. I mean, for example, let's say we, we had an assumption that everything runs in user mode, right? Supposing they have a, a kernel mode rootkit which is able to hide what we can monitor, it can get past, you know, get, get around it. So. Uh, there's no 100% solution here. We can only fight what we can see. OK, with, with that, uh, we have to stop. Um, I'd like to thank the speakers for a wonderful talk. And I saw people in the audience still actually have interest, including the man without a voice back there. So uh, I'm sure yeah, you can make yourself available for other questions Absolutely. later on. Thank you very much. Thank you.